Um, right. So uh, in this talk, we're going to talk about uh, a Bayesian approach to language understanding with uh, something we call non-parametric variational transformers. So the, this uh, work is part of a, a bigger kind of picture of what we're trying to do. And uh, that has to do with the nature of things. So why is it when we conceptualize the world, we think about the world as a collection of objects, not as a holistic sea of features, um, but we segment those information into objects. Or in linguistics, we think about uh, language not as a sequence of acoustic features, but as uh, constituents, phonemes, morphemes, words, syntactic constituents, or um, discourse entities. At every level of representation, the situation is being described in, towards, in terms of a set of things. So why? Why do we do that? Um, what I'm going to argue in this talk is the reason we do that is because we're doing non-parametric Bayesian inference of mixture distributions. So probably uh, not expecting you to, to have that be an intuitive thing that uh, uh, you can grasp right away, but hopefully by the end of the talk I'll convince you that that's why we segment the world into objects, because uh, we're doing non-parametric Bayesian inference. In particular, um, these mixture distributions have components of the mixture, and each component is associated with an entity, an object. These objects, uh, these components are unordered because it's a mixture distribution. And the mixture can be variable complexity. It can have varying number of components in it. Um, and to make this, these representations learnable, we're assuming that actually our, our internal representations are distributions over mixture distributions, which helps with learning. So that's the story um, in a nutshell, and hopefully by the end I will have convinced you of that story. So let's start back to w the nature of things. So what, how do, what evidence do we have about uh, the way in which people conceptualize the world as a set of objects. Well, one thing to look at is linguistic theories. Um, so linguistics has studied uh, for a long time the nature of language, and language is clearly related to thought. Pretty much everything you can say you can think, and everything you can think you can say. So the, somehow the structure of language and the structure of thought are closely related. So if we understand the structure of language, this should help us uh, understand the nature of things. So what does linguistics tell us about, about uh, the representations of language? Well, first of all, there are constituents. Every level of representation has constituents. And the rules of language generalize across those constituents. That's what's known as systematicity. Um, <clears throat> also, we know that the rules that apply to short texts are the same as the rules that apply to long texts. You don't have to learn a new something new about language just because you're reading a sentence that's 200 words long and you've never done that before. Um, and finally, the linguistic representations are somehow fundamentally unordered. The surface form is, a, is an ordered thing. But when you get to the deep syntactic regularities or the semantic regularities, um, it's an unordered representation where the important thing is the structural relationships between these constituents. And the structures are not just the linear structure that you observe. So those are kind of high level things we know about constituency from uh, language. What else, where else can we get information about constituency? Well, 
um, transformers, so large language models, are extremely effective models of language. Somehow they, uh, under, they have, have learned the generalizations of language very well, and maybe even in some cases learned uh, thought, made some things about reasoning. Um, so what do transformers tell us about the nature of things? Well, transformers do not embed a text in, into a single vector. They embed a text into a sequence of vectors. And the parameters of the model are shared across the different positions in that sequence. So it's a lot like systematicity and um, uh, constituency in linguistics. Um, we know attention works for short texts and for long texts. The attention function is just a normalized weighting. It, it generalizes across wide variations in how many vectors you're paying attention to. So that's also like uh, linguistics. Um, and the vectors that are being looked at with attention, the order is not really important. You have to embed the order using position embeddings. Otherwise, you wouldn't know what order the vectors are. Attention doesn't look at order. So that is also like this um, unordered nature. But the attention function, the weights, the relationships that are, uh, you know, the attention function extracts relationships uh, via the, the attention weights. And so that is a structured representation. We know that that embeds a lot of, uh, for example, linguistic structure. So it kind of has a lot of the same characteristics we would expect uh, based on uh, our understanding from, from linguistic theory. <clears throat> so if we want to say the empirical success of transformers is evidence about um, the nature of language and therefore constituency, uh, you know, maybe that's not true. Maybe there are other things that explain the empirical success of, of transformers. So one thing you often hear is they're successful just because they're big, they have lots of parameters, and they're trained on an enormous amount of data. So maybe that's part of the success, but that can't be the whole story. You know, if that were the case, we should be able to train an MLP. We have, you know, a fixed window of text, we just have a giant MLP over that window and we train that. That should work, it doesn't work. We know that doesn't work. So why, why, is trans, why do we train this, train this complicated transformer? It must, you know, that complication must have something to do with improved generalization. Another possible explanation is parallel to distributed processing. So in the 90s, this was an important concept for motivating neural networks, motivated by the kind of nature of computation in the brain. These days, it's motivated by GPUs. If, if we have an algorithm, if we have a model that will fit well on a GPU, run in parallel, then you know, maybe that's all we need. That's, that's the reason why transformers work so well, just because they fit on a chip really well. A lot of people, a lot of work in transformers is basically that. How do we fit? You know, the original paper on transformers did not have the, some enormous uh, empirical gain in language. They just said it runs faster on a chip. That was the reason they, they proposed transformers. Okay, but that can't be the whole story. Again, why, why not just use MLPs? It, they run perfectly well on the chip. So. What is it? We think that what's really important about the empirical success of transformers is attention. Attention is all you need. It's a core part of the model of transformers. And so uh, if we understand attention, then we'll understand the inductive bias that gives us this uh, incredible empirical perf uh, performance. Okay. so. We propose a, a computational model, an abstract computational model that we think captures these, uh, uh, the fundamental characteristics of, perform of transformers um, that characterize 
their inductive bias that's been so successful. And we do that by using the, uh, you know, the theoretical foundations of deep learning, namely Bayesian probability theory. Okay, so um, we're assuming, first of all, that the, the inductive bias fundamentally has to do with the latent representations. So those are the, the, the sequences of vectors over which attention is being applied. Um, as we s talked about, the, it's a sequence of vectors, so it's more than one vector. The number of vectors can vary because it's, it's the same as the number of tokens of the sentence uh, of the input text, and the text can vary uh, in length. And those vectors are interpreted by the attention function. If it doesn't mean something to the attention function, then it doesn't mean anything. It, the, the, in particular, if we look at um, an encoder-decoder, you know, the output of the encoder is not seen by anybody other than the decoder looking at it via, via attention. So if the information doesn't go through attention, it's lost. Um, we show that this level of, of representation um, is uh, in, a Bayesian representation in that it's a probability distribution. We can model that sequence of vectors as a mixture distribution. And we can generalize this definition of attention then to any mixture distribution. So I'll explain that. And then um, given that, we define a Bayesian approach to this, which means we want a distribution over mixture distributions um, and we do that using vari variational Bayesian methods, and particularly using Bayesian nonparametrics. So I'll explain, I'll explain that. And uh, what we show in our experiments is that when we have a better approximation to Bayesian nonparametrics, we end up with an empirically better, in some respects, uh, model. Okay. And so in the process of this argument, we'll make an, a, a series of, of contributions. First set of contributions is just on understanding the nature of transformers. We talk about the nature of their representations as being Bayesian. Um, the, this um, variational Bayesian approach gives us a regularizer over those representations and it allows us to give a non-parametric Bayesian inter interpretation even of pre-trained transformers that have not been trained with this regularizer. So that's all without any training, just reinterpreting transformers. If we add training, um, we talk about uh, representation learning with, with this uh, variational Bayesian regularizer called non-parametric variational autoencoders. And um, we also look at uh, what kind of abstract units you get when you apply these regularizers. So that was just the introduction. Now we're gonna go back over most of that stuff again, but slower. Um, so first talk about attention-based representations. <clears throat> So attention, as we said, has, uh, well, if we just look at the case of the output of the encoder and look, it outputs a sequence of vectors, right? One for each token in the input. Then attention, the decoder issues a query which finds the, the nearby uh, vector, so Z is our, our vectors, U is our query, dot product finds the nearby vectors, the attention weight then um, does a normalized exponential and we, we average our, those vectors for, by that attention weight. Right? This is just standard dot product uh, attention. So let's analyze that in more detail. First thing to note is that this function is permutation invariant, right? The index is here. 
don't matter. I could re-index everything. I'd get exactly the same function. So the order is not important. We can just plot these, these vectors in a vector space and treat it as a set. The other thing to notice is that this attention weight is, is normalized. So we're imposing a normalized weighting over these vectors. If we have a normalized weighting, then it's not a, a, a set anymore. It's a distribution over vectors. So here we just put a little probability, oops, a little probability mass on each vector, right? Also, um, the, the number of vectors is variable. This n can be anything, and it's still perfectly good function. So um, the number of vectors we have in our distribution can, can vary. And these properties are exactly the properties that you see with non-parametric space of mixture distributions. So it's uh, you know, each one of these impulses is a component of the mixture. The height of the impulse is the mixture weight. There, the ordering is not relevant and you can have as many components as you want. So this is kind of uh, mixture distributions are really a good model of what's going on in attention. If we say, okay, transformer embeddings are not sequences of vectors, they're non-parametric mixtures of impulse distributions, then it turns out we can also reinterpret attention as Bayesian query denoising. So the vectors, as we saw, uh, specify a distribution that we interpret as a prior distribution. The query we interpret as an, an observation, but it's a noisy observation, so we've put a Gaussian around it. Now if we set these heights in, in the right way, based on the L2 norm, then what happens is the the posterior distribution, the prior plus the observation, is exactly the function of uh, the attention weights. And that means that the uh, result of, of attention is exactly the expected value of the posterior distribution. So expected value of the posterior given an observation is query denoising. So what we've shown is that the attention function can be generalized to, can be a map to query denoising, where the sequence of vectors maps to a prior distribution, the query vector maps to a noisy observation, and the result of attention is the expected value of the posterior. So those are all just exact equivalences, but in fact, what we can now do is generalize beyond normal attention. We can say our latent space is any mixture distribution. And as long as we can compute query denoising given that prior, uh, we have a perfectly good definition of, a, of attention. Okay, for one thing, the heights of these vectors don't have to be a function of the L2 norm, which they need for, for equivalence with, with attention. It could be anything and we can still compute the denoising. Also, the mixture components don't have to be impulse distributions. They could be, for example, Gaussians. We start with our mixture of Gaussians, that's our prior. We see a Gaussian, that's our, our noisy observation. The posterior, because the multiplication of two Gaussians is a Gaussian, so the posterior is also a mixture of Gaussians. We take the expectation of that, and we have our definition of attention. Right? So we've generalized um, attention to query denoising uh, over these uh, uh, mixture distributions. And that, that's a generalization in that the, the set of vectors don't have to be uh, parameterizing an in, a mixture of impulse distributions. It can be any mixture. Um, But mixture distributions have a problem. What if we want to learn the, the mixture distribution? 
So in particular, we want to learn how many vectors, how many components we have in our mixture. So transformers don't do this. You hand code or you define ahead of time how many tokens you have in your input. That's exactly the number of vectors you have in the output. There's no learning of how many vectors. If we want to learn that latent space, we want to be able to learn how many vectors. But the number of vectors is an integer. You can't have half a component in your mixture model. So how do you learn over a discrete space, like the space of integers? It's very hard to learn over discrete spaces. It's much easier to learn over distributions over a discrete space, because the distributions are continuous. So that's what we do. We learn distributions over mixture distributions. Right. So that's the first part, just understanding attention. And now we're going to talk about how to model distributions over mixture distributions. And to do that, we're using variational Bayesian methods. Okay. So the classic variational Bayesian method for representation learning is a variational autoencoder. We have an encoder it goes through some compressed space, and then you try to reconstruct that input using a decoder. Um, in the various classic variational autoencoder, the, this latent space is a vector. So the encoder outputs the parameters of a distribution over vectors. Sampling from that distribution gives you a single vector, which gets input to your decoder. Right. The sampling adds noise, and the noise removes information. So that this this uh, this uh, what's called a variational information bottleneck is removing the information output by the decoder. You still have the reconstruction loss, so it needs enough information to reconstruct the sentence. But there's this regularizer, the KL divergence that's trying to minimize the amount of information. So the, the latent space has as little information as possible such that you can still reconstruct the sentence. So any irrelevant information gets uh, filtered out and you just have the most compressed representation you can. So that's how a variational autoencoder works using this variational information bottleneck as the regularizer. So we want to generalize that to transformers, right? We don't have a vector space anymore. We have a sequence of vectors that are output by our encoder. And the decoder needs to access the sequence of vectors. But we put this um, non-parametric variational information bottleneck in the middle that samples our mixture distributions, and then we apply denoising attention to that sample. So how do we define these distributions over mixture distributions so that we can define this information bottleneck? Um, our, posterior, our posterior, the thing that we're sampling from, is a Dirichlet process. So sorry, this is all coming from Bayesian nonparametrics because Bayesian nonparametrics is a, uh, tells us a, a lot of theory, has a lot of theory about how to define distributions over mixture distributions where you don't know ahead of time how many components the mixture has. So that's the non-parametric part. Uh, there, isn't, there isn't a fixed number of parameters that describe your whole space because you may have more components than you can specify in that fixed set of parameters. That's Bayesian non-parametrics. And Dirichlet processes are, are basically the simplest kind of Bayesian non-parametric distribution. <clears throat> Sampling from the Dirichlet process gives us a mixture distribution. And if we look at the distribution over uh, mixtures of impulse distributions here, if we, each one of these is one sample. If we look at the distribution over each of these samples, we actually get this base distribution of the Dirichlet process is, is the mean distribution uh, compared. So when we 
at test time, when we're not doing any sampling, we want to condition on the mean. That's, that's what uh, variational autoencoders do. And so we can still use denoising attention and just apply it to this mixture of Gaussians, like we saw earlier. And to the decoder, this mixture of Gaussians looks like a typical example that it saw at training time, even at, though at training time, it's only seeing mixtures of impulse distributions. So that's cool. Um, <clears throat> another thing that's cool about Dir Dirichli processes is they are conjugate prior. So if you have a prior that's a Dirichli process and you see a set of observations, it's, there's a very simple formula for updating that to give you your posterior, which is also a Dirichli process. You basically add these uh, distributions. Each one of your observations is some little, little distribution with a pseudo count associated with it, and we just add all those things up, and we get the posterior. So that's great. We have a, you know, just a fixed formula for computing the posterior from the uh, from the observations. <clears throat> Then we also need some meaningful KL divergence to regularize the, the latent, the, this posterior to make it have less information in it. And when we sample uh, from the, the Dirichlet process, uh, we need to be able to backprop through that sampling. So that's called the reparameterization trick for VAEs. Um, both those steps are a bit messy and require some uh, approximations, not as beautiful as the earlier things I, I said. Okay, um, one of the interesting things about this, this regularizer, the KL divergence regularizer, is it gives you sparsity. That's the way in which it learns the number of vectors. So if we have here an output which has lots of candidate components. But each one of those components has a pseudo count alpha associated with it. And what the KL divergence is doing is it's pushing down that total pseudo, the, the total of all those pseudo counts because that kind of reduces the number, of, effectively reduces the number of vectors you get here which reduces the amount of information. If you push down the total, you end up pushing down some of the individual pseudo counts to exactly zero. When those pseudo counts go to zero, it's as if they don't exist. That component has been removed from the posterior entirely. So you have vectors that are, are outputting parameters, but they get dropped. So that's the sense in which you end up introducing uh, sparsity. You, you learn fewer to use fewer components than the number of vectors that are being output by your encoder here. Okay. <clears throat> so this gives us our non-parametric variational information bottleneck, a variational information bottleneck for transformers. The Dirichlet process is used to define a distribution over mixture distributions, sampling gives us a normy, normal, a noisy version of the Dirichlet process's space distribution, which we then access um, with denoising attention by the, the decoder, and the noise level is regularized um, using the NVIB re, re, KL divergence regularizer. Now, given that VIB layer, we can build our variational autoencoder for transformers just by sticking that on top of a transformer encoder uh, that outputs for each vector output by the transformer encoder. We map that vector into the parameters of a pseudo observation, a Gaussian and a pseudo count. Then the transformer decoder just uses denoising attention to ask, access the samples. <clears throat> and the NVIB regularizer controls the information that goes through that bottleneck, that interface. Okay, so that's, um, 
a way of, represent, of, of characterizing, a, it's a, general, a generalization of transformers, right? But is that really, a, a, does that have really help us understand transformers? NVIB has a particular notion of, of what counts as information in its latent representation. Is that the same way that transformers are using to represent information? If it is, uh, well, if it isn't, then things that look like small changes to NVIB will turn out to be big changes to a transformer. It'll, ru it'll remove valuable information, have cascading of errors, the whole model will break. If this NVIB is a good characterization of the way transformers are representing information, then if we make small changes, so we add small amounts of uncertainty to our representation, that won't, it won't remove the, the reliable information. It will only remove the unreliable information. Things that were unreliable in the data will end up being unreliable in the embedding. And so adding a little bit of uncertainty will only remove those unreliable things. So we would expect not, uh, not to have any degradation in domain and potentially even have a better performance out of domain because those unreliable statistics are one of the uh, reasons you get overfitting. So first of all, um, we use that, uh, you know, that, that um, mapping I showed you at the beginning in trying to understand attention to define a exact uh, equivalence. Um, all right, so first of all, what do we do? We, we take pre-trained transformers. So um, these are, are transformers that have been trained without any notion of NVIB. It's no, no regularization of this kind, uh, so it, it's, uh, it's not built into the model in the sense that it is when you train a VAE. We replace all instances of attention with denoising attention. And every time you have a set of, or a sequence of vectors that's input to an attention function, we map those vectors into um, uh, observation, the uh, pseudo observations that, that map into uh, our mixture distribution, our, our Dirichlet process representation. That mapping into pseudo-observations adds uncertainty. So we can have uh, models like this where you know, the, the, even if it's a distribution over vectors, uh, it looks a lot like impulse distributions. There's basically only one thing that you ever get when you sample from that distribution. Or you could have mappings that are like this. You can't really see them very well, but that's supposed to be a mixture of Gaussians. Um, that has more variance, it has more weight on the prior distribution, and uh, so more uncertainty. Um, and we vary between those two extremes with hyperparameters. Adding more uncertainty in some sense satisfies the N NVIB regularizer more, but we're not actually learning anything. All we're doing is adjusting hyperparameters. Okay, so the first thing we want to try is what if we just have very low uncertainty, non-zero, but low, does, do we get exact equivalence? And we do get exact equivalence. We predict exactly the same uh, outputs as for the original transformer. And we see that in this plot uh, by these points that are at 100%. So this is how how much overlap there is between the original transformer and this new uh, mapping into NVIB. And because it's exactly the same predictions, it's also exactly the same accuracies. This is a summarization model. As we increase our, our hyperparameters to add more uncertainty, we start getting predictions that are more and more different from the original transformer. But interestingly, it doesn't just drop. You, know, you don't just get a drop in performance as soon as you change anything. 
At the beginning, you're getting different predictions, but they're exactly as good as the original predictions. This is really surprising. So we, there's even some slight improvements. But basically, these are variations in things that the model could have done, but um, they're all equally good. So that's exactly the kind of thing we're expecting to see, or hoping to see. Um, different outputs, but they're equally accurate because the information that's being removed is exactly the unreliable information that doesn't generalize well. Now if we look out of domain, we actually get improvements. So some of these are quite substantial improvements in the out of domain generalization. So this is a summarization model, removing information maybe is, is something you would expect a summarization model to work well on. We've also done this with translation, um, not as impressive, but we still get improvements, even for translation. So we're getting improved uh, out of distribution OOD generalization by adding this regularizer post-training. No training at all, we just change some hyperparameters and we get better generalization. So this seems to indicate that NVIB, the way it characterizes information content, is really the way transformers, pre-trained transformers, are encoding information. We can get exact equivalence, we can get uh, post-training regularization that doesn't degrade in domain uh, performance, but actually gives improvements out of, out of domain. So if this is capturing the way transformers are representing information, and transformers, we know, have a, a very good inductive bias for natural language, that seems to suggest that NVIB has a good inductive bias for um, natural language. Um, right. So that didn't have any training. What happens if we start looking at, at learning with using this regularizer, taking advantage of this inductive bias? Well, the first thing we uh, have tried is to use that uh, non-parametric variational autoencoder introduced earlier and train it on uh, reconstruction and look at what the the latent space looks like. We're using the KL divergence to regularize, and then we use hyperparameters to adjust how important is it to reconstruct exactly correctly and versus how important is it to regularize um, strongly with the KL divergence. And we can vary the strength of the, the uh, regularizer that way. So if we just keep all the vectors, that's the screen point, then um, we re reconstruct perfectly, right? As we increase our, our regularization, we start dropping some of the vectors. But we still get perfect reconstruction. So you can drop up to two-thirds of the vectors, and you can still get perfect reconstruction. So a lot of those vectors are not useful. You can compress the same amount of information into a few vectors. At some point, um, you don't have enough vectors. You start losing too much information, and, and reconstruction uh, performance drops. Also, if again we look at that, um, the option of just keeping all the vectors, well, we saw that it reconstructs well. It also covers the space well. You know, that that's uh, here, we're getting good um, uh, coverage of the range of possible sentences when we sample from the prior and generate uh, from this model. But there are a lot of, of, of sentences that get generated that are just bad sentences. So that's why you're, this is the perplexity on a pre-trained model uh, applied to the generated sentences. Some of them are really bad if you keep all, all, your, all your vectors. But if you regularize, 
they're all pretty good. You know, it doesn't generate sentences that are just total garbage. So the, if you keep all the vectors, you end up with a latent space where there's somehow these holes in the space where it's just generating garbage, whereas NVIB closes those holes and you get reasonable generation all the way. Another way to look at that is to interpolate. So we take a sentence, we embed it in, uh, in latent space, take another sentence, embed it, interpolate between those embeddings, and then generate sentences from each of those possible interp interpolations. At one extreme of the interpolation, you get exactly reconstructing S2. At the other extreme, you get exactly reconstructing S1. In between, you hope to see things that are similar to both sides. And with NVIB, you get that. With, if you keep all the vectors, you don't. It generates S1 for a while, then it generates garbage, then it generates S2 for a while. There, there's just no similarity in the middle. So again, the, the, if we don't compress with NVIB, we get holes in our latent space. NVIB gives us a smoother space. So that was just training this cross attention with NVIB. Everything else was just a normal transformer. Now, what if we uh, apply NVIB to self-attention, in particular, lay stacked layers of self-attention, and look at how does that affect uh, what kinds of things we, uh, we learn, what kind of representations we learn. So as we add, because we're adding NVIB regularization, you start getting these vectors, these, these blank columns here, this is, these are uh, input um, characters, and so this is the attention map, sorry. The, each character is looking at the other characters, and these blank columns are the, the vectors that have been dropped. On the um, transformer side, you're basically looking at your neighbors. As we stack these layers, it gets more and more sparse as, as we go up. Until at the top, we're getting lots of sparsity. Lots of vectors are being dropped, and big chunks of the input are being encoded in single vectors. So that's, that's really interesting. But if we look at those vectors, they turn out to be really highly correlated with words. The model has never been trained on words. It's just trained in on, on characters. The, the spaces are input, but it learns that characters inside a word are more highly correlated than characters across spaces. So it groups the characters by words. So not exactly by words, but it seems to really, really discover words. And if we do a, a a, uh, a comparison, how well do these uh, spans, these segments correlate with words, we do get a much better correlation um, with uh, NVIB regularization than we do without. So that's really cool. That's the, the learning, it's learning abstractions where the units do kind of, at least in this case, roughly correspond to the kind of linguistic units you might expect. I mean, there, there's a lot, a lot more work to do in this line, but at least the initial results are, are in the right direction. Um, so we've argued that adding this NVIB regularization gives us better, uh, induces better representations. It uses fewer vectors, it's a smoother space, in the space of texts, the, the latent space, and it learns meaningful abstract units. And so you might say that a better approximation, because transformers we showed are already a, an approximation to uh, Bayesian nonparametric inference, um, but this, this model is a better approximation, so better approximations gives us better inductive bias, at least in the respect to these characteristics. Okay, so now to conclude, 
we um, made a number of contributions. One, we showed that attention-based representations can be reinterpreted as non-parametric mixture distributions. We proposed a non-parametric variational information bottleneck that regularizes these attention-based representations. We showed that pre-trained transformers can be reinterpreted in this, uh, using this NVIB, um, and it, it gives us uh, a nice regularizer and um, captures the way transformers are, are representing information. And we showed that NVIB improves representation learning in that uh, we get better OOD generalization, smoother latent spaces, and uh, meaningful units. At a higher level, what we've done is we've developed this non-parametric variational transformer architecture that has the empirical effectiveness of transformers um, and the Bayesian regularizer from variational autoencoders and shown that this model has a good inductive bias for natural language. Um, also, this, rep this version of transformers helps us understand uh, transformers we all know and love. So based on that understanding, why do transformers work so well? Well, because they're approximating non-parametric Bayesian inference, right? The latent representations are non-parametric mixture distributions. The encoder is doing non-parametric Bayesian inference of those mixture distributions, and the decoder is a non-parametric Bayesian generative model. We also have suggestive results that better approximations lead to better uh, models of natural language empirically. Why would that be? That would be true if the underlying phenomena of human language uh, fits this model that we're, we're approximating. In other words, that human language and human thoughts are distributions over mixture distributions. Right, so that's that's the you know a bit of a step, but uh, that's the argument. And now, obviously, that means that language understanding and human thought is non-parametric Bayesian inference of mixture distributions. So you should all know what this means now. <laughs> Things are components of the mixture distribution. Those components, those things are. Uh, fundamentally unordered representation. They can have variable complexity in that the number of components can grow, number of things can grow arbitrarily large, and that these representations are made learnable by having distributions over mixture distributions as our fundamental representation. Okay, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Um, I would have a question, uh, actually, regarding the disentanglement. Um, because you, you just mentioned that uh, the transformer with NVIP can better solve the problem, uh, get, we can better remove the unreliable information. So I'm just thinking that uh, how what do you think, like when we compare a transformer with NVIP with a standard transformer uh, with respect to a problem like disentanglement, um, can, should, be able, should be able to address that, this problem better, um, NVIP? I, I didn't understand the, the last bit of the question. Yeah, uh, no, uh, the, the question is, is it's quite simple. Uh, what is the effect over the disentanglement? Disentanglement. Yeah, if we combine NVIP with uh, the transformer. Yeah, this is, I mean, we have not done the large-scale experiments, so really we, we should be training uh, large-scale language models to answer that question. The, um, I think the, the stack self-attention ones kind of hint at the kind of a disentanglement uh, yeah. we, we might see, and certainly the kind of a disentanglement we hope to see mm -hmm. is that uh, different vectors end up re representing different uh, constituents, different things in the world. Um, 
things presumably are like bundles of correlated features, and so you kind of expect an individual vector to, to capture that. But yeah, this, there, there's a lot of work to be done in the direction of disentanglement. See? Okay, um, so yeah, I had a question on what, so, so you spoke about cross-attention and self-attention, but we know also that, yeah, for instance, self-attention, it has limits eh, because of the computation complexity yeah. and the context we can model, basically. Right. And I was wondering, can you say something about uh, this NVIB model on, on the complexity, the speeds? Uh, the sampling, yeah, it's uh, and could we go with, could eventually we could go to larger context and make abstractions? Now you may, you say we make abstractions on kind of the world, worth of constituent level, but maybe we can make abstractions even larger context. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, right now, I mean, we haven't addressed that issue at all. Everything's n squared, I mean, a little bit maybe because you're dropping some of the vectors, so the, the n is, is maybe half as big. But um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to that question. I mean, the, I, I completely agree that to this, I'm hoping it has the potential that we can have multiple levels of representation with where the lower levels are like uh, more fine-grained, and the higher levels are coarser, and somehow collectively they, they represent the situation. So that, you know, if you have, uh, you know, attention at the higher level can s cover a much longer time span and still be over the same number of vectors as, as attention at the lower level. Um, so possibly something there just by using the sparsity. Um, the other possible uh, in, uh, <clears throat> direction of future research, because we haven't done any of this, um, is by understanding that the set of keys is actually representing a distribution, we can do some kind of clustering and, and you know, dropping of, of vectors so that we can approximate that distribution that has 10,000 components to it with the distribution that only has a thousand components, and and like measure how well we're approximating those distributions and decide, okay, you know these things cluster nicely. I can I can replace them all with one Gaussian. This thing I can't. So it kind of gives us a, a way to reason about what what we could potentially drop. Other questions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the, the, okay, so of course, I didn't actually do this work. This, the, the person who did it maybe can answer your question better, but, um, no, that was it. Where was it? This one? No, anyway. Um, uh, the OOD experiments. Right, so the OOD graph was done by, we take the space of hypes, hyperparameters, we kind of find the borders where e we adjust each hyper, there are like four, three or four hyperparameters. And they, each one of them adds uncertainty to a different part of the model. And we vary that one until things break. And that gives us like a box of range of hyperparameters. And the graph was produced by taking the diagonal in that box and just tracing it out, okay? The OOD results were done with a validation set in, 
in the out of domain validation set where you're doing a random sample across the whole box and finding where, where the best performing points are. Okay, and I don't really know where those best performing points lie on that curve, in the in-domain curve. Um, so I can't answer your question, but that maybe gives you a better idea of, of, uh, of, of what might be going on. Yeah, well, you were the one who invented the denoising is all we need <laughs> motto. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Uh, there, I mean, there does seem to be something true about the, the um, hierarchical structure, at least in syntax. Um, you know, uh, Co-reference resolution, probably not. It's just some arbitrary graph. You know, phonetics, it's the string order. It's all that matters. Um, syntax seems to be somewhere in between where things are kind of still rooted in the sequence. And maybe that's why you end up with these hierarchical relationships. I don't know. A lot of people have said that somehow hierarchical structures are innate. You know, the, the, there's an innate bias towards hierarchical structures. This model does not predict that. And, uh, you would have to add some more things to it. Um, and yeah, I don't have a good story about why you would end up with hierarchical structures. Um, you know, dependency theory doesn't really assume hierarchical structures, although, well, it is always a tree, so, whereas, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yes, I'm sure there are other biases, and I don't know what they are, and I don't know where they come from. <laughs> you have other questions? Okay, I, I guess no. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much. Thanks, everybody.